Thanks. Actually, the, the, the story behind missing that uh, TEDx is that, the, the first one, is that I decided that I wanted to spend the time with my family instead, and it was a big decision. So for this one, I just decided to bring my family with me. So if you could just kind of say thank you. When I was 10 years old, in fifth grade, I applied to get into a Jewish school. And both my brothers had applied and gotten into this Jewish school. And I felt like the stakes were high, that um, I didn't want to be the only one not in. But I had a problem, and the problem was Hebrew. And I wasn't particularly good at it. And I had a very, very hard time memorizing Hebrew words. And I remember looking at the translation sheets, and I would cover the, the Hebrew and look at the English and try to translate for myself. And I had a very hard time remembering. So I got into the interview. And the interview was with a rabbi, Rabbi Bax. And he looked the part and the long beard and the hat and the tie, which for me always meant rabbi. And, and, he, um, and the first thing for the interview is he pointed on his desk to a picture, a photograph. And he said, maze, what is this? Now I knew that what he wanted was for me to say the Hebrew word for picture. But I couldn't, for the life of me, remember what that word was. And I could see in my translation sheet, I could see picture in English, but I couldn't see it in Hebrew. I just couldn't remember it. So I started to sweat, and I started to get nervous. And I looked at the picture, and I'm thinking, what is the word for picture? What is the word for picture? And there was, the picture was of a little boy and a dog, and they were running. And I thought, OK, I don't know the word for picture, but I know the word for boy. And I said, Yeled, boy. And he said, no, no, no. Ze. And he picked up the picture in his hand like this. He picked it up. And he said, Ze, ma ze, what is this? And I thought, God, what is picture? What is picture? I don't know picture. What is picture? And I did notice that his thumb was pointing directly at the dog. OK? And I knew the word for dog. So I said, Kelev, dog. And he said, no, 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 no. And he took and he picked up the picture like this, and he held it in both his hands, and he kind of shook it a little bit. Maze, what is this? And he wasn't pointing to anything. <laughs> but it was a picture of a dog and a boy. And I thought, I'm all over this. Chaverim, friends, friends. <laughs> right, chaverim. And in frustration, he goes, no, 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 tmuna which is the word for picture. I was like, oh, yeah, of course, tmuna. I didn't know that's what you wanted. Right? I got in. That was my first memory of the importance of knowing things. That if I knew things, or in this particular case, if I pretended to know things, and I got away with it, that I would get what I wanted, that I would continue to move on from thing to thing, from school to school to jobs, and that in our culture, I very, very quickly learned that knowing things, or pretending to know things, right, was the way to success, to achievement. And that worked for me. And like in my interview, when I didn't know things, I kind of pretended to know things. And I kept moving on. Well, I was in my first job at Outward Bound. I was an Outward Bound instructor and a Knowles instructor, National Outdoor Leadership School, teaching leadership using the outdoors as the metaphor and the medium. And um, I, I very quickly went from not knowing anything about camping to being a teacher of camping. I went from asking all the questions to having to have all the answers. And I very quickly learned that when you're camping, you could pretty much answer every question with one of four things. Put on a hat, drink more water, look at your map. And then the final one was, what do you think? <laughs> right? And what do you think worked really well for me? It still does, to be honest. Right? What do you think? And then people start to think, and then we begin to think together. But there was one day when that didn't work anymore. I was the course director at Outward Bound for a group of 150 eighth graders. This is not my normal audience, right? 150 eighth graders. And I was responsible for a two-day retreat that they were on. And it was the first time I was a course director. And I had eight different instructors who were working for me who were going to run the program. And I was nervous. And I planned it out. 
and I looked very, very carefully at, at exactly what the plan would be. And I broke up the, the eighth graders into lots of different groups. And I looked at those groups, and I designed activities for them. And I came, and I trained all the instructors, and I had perfectly beautiful folders for each one of them describing which children they would have and what the activities were. And I spent a three hour training telling them exactly what they would do. And there was some pushback about would this work and that wouldn't work. But I sort of knew I had done my thinking, I had done my planning, I knew what I needed to do and I pushed it through. And then four Greyhound buses drove through the campground gates, dust flowing behind. And the minute the first eighth grader walked off the bus, followed by 149 others, I was screwed. <laughs> right? they, they started fighting. They, there was a fight between two kids. And one kid fell and scraped his knee. They didn't like anything that I had planned for them. I gave this beautiful welcome speech that not a single person heard. They, they, and, and they were bored. That was the worst. How did I know they were bored? Because they're eighth graders. They told me. Right? <laughs> we said, I'm bored. This sucks. Right? So I didn't know what to do. And I tried to push through my plan, and it wasn't working. And eventually, I walked in the campground over to a building on the back, and I shut a door, and I turned off the lights in the room, and I freaked out. <laughs> I just freaked out. And I cried. And I sat there in the space of not knowing what to do. <clears throat> not knowing what to do, I don't know, is an incredibly painful place to be. For someone who's used to sort of being in control and knowing what it is that you're going to do and where you're going, or at least pretending to know, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what would work. There's incredible social risk to not knowing. There's incredible vulnerability to not knowing. And I sat there in all of it. And in that dark room, I was learning a very, very important lesson. And I've returned to that dark room time and time again. Because I don't know is the reality of life. We, we live and let, we don't know on an ultimate level. We don't know what any of this is about. We know that we start by being born and we end by dying. And somewhere in there, we probably get sick. And we don't know anything about it. We don't ultimately know what we're doing. And sitting in that vulnerable place and feeling what it felt like to not know turned out to be an incredibly important early lesson. And I walked out of that room. And I walked to the instructors. And I asked the teachers to take over. It was lunchtime now. They'd been there for a few hours. For the teachers to take over the students. And I brought the instructors into another room. And I shut the door. And I said, I said I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I screwed up. I, I know I had this great plan. I know some of you pushed back. And I know it's not working. And the truth is, I don't have the answer. I don't know what to do next. And then one woman, a woman who I had had some disagreements with in the past about this very plan, started to speak. And I thought, here it comes. <laughs> right? Here it comes. And what she said is, uh, Peter, you know, I have a background in theater. And what I'm thinking is, maybe I take a bunch of the kids who are interested in theater, and I do some acting dealing with some of the issues that they're facing as they become teenagers. And then we could do a show at the end of the night. And then another woman said, hey, I've got an idea. We have a bunch of Polaroid cameras. How about I take a group of kids up to the fire tower on top of the hill, and we do some kind of cool instant photography with the Polaroid cameras. And one by one, these people started coming up with ideas on the fly as to what they could do to turn this thing around. Now, that is the other side of I don't know. The one side of it is it's incredibly scary and vulnerable. The other side is every creative and innovative idea comes out of that room of I don't know. Knowing things is ultimately boring. Right? When you know something, you're done. You know it. There's nowhere to go with this. You know who understands this better than anyone? Storytellers. You watch, did anyone watch Lost? The, the show Lost? Yeah. OK. So you sat through 50 hours of knowing nothing. <laughs> right? 50 hours. You start from the beginning, and it's a question. And then for four years, you learn nothing. 
until the last minute. And uh, the truth is, I, I don't know if we ever still knew anything. I don't know. But they do that with every single good television show, CSI, NCIS, all of these fun mystery shows. They start with something happens, a question mark. Someone gets killed. Who was killed? Why? And we spend an hour not knowing anything, gripped, engaged, connected, not wanting to leave until we find out in the last minute what happens. That's kind of life. The most engagement, the most creativity, the most innovation comes not from knowing things, but from not knowing things. How far are we willing to go with this? Should leaders not know things? Right? We follow leaders because they know things. Right? My work is with CEOs. I'm an advisor to CEOs and their leadership teams. Surely they should know things, right? Because that's why we follow them. Well, I started off in school in fifth grade, and I'm going back to school. I'm in school now. I'm in a school run by a remarkable woman named Ann Bradney, who teaches a, a sort of leadership training out in California. And the focus of this leader training is very much about getting in touch with your emotions and what are you feeling and being connected to things you've repressed that you were feeling for a while. And then to right now, what is it that you're feeling and accessing that in order to become a more powerful leader. And she was running a diversity training. Now, I have to tell you, I love diversity. I have a hard time with diversity trainings. I find that most of them uh, actually, well, don't work and that they, uh, in my experience, engender prejudice more than, than create it. And what this training was asking us to do is to step into a role that we see ourselves. Who are we? You know, am I in this box or that box or that box? And I don't want to be in a box. And I had a very strong reaction to that. I didn't want to be stereotyped. I didn't feel like a stereotype. I didn't want to stereotype other people. And I was fighting back. And I was saying, I don't like the way this is going. And there was a group of us fighting back. Now, we're all students in her school. She is the leader. She is the principal. Right? So not only were her teachers there, but her students. I'm her client. And I'm her client. And I'm saying to her, I, I don't think this is a good thing to do. I don't like this. I don't like the way we're doing it. And there were a group of people. And there was a lot of energy. And I was saying, what is it that you're thinking? What are you trying to achieve here? And she finally turned all red in the face. And she said, I don't know. I don't know. Now, you would think at that point that I would lose all trust in her. But the exact opposite happened, and not just to me, but for the whole room. There was this awkward silence. And then people started changing the way they were approaching it. No longer were we fighting with her, but we were working with her. Why? Because she had admitted to not knowing exactly what was happening. And our feeling, my feeling, was, well, if she doesn't know, I need to help. I need to help figure this out, because I'm not pushing against someone who's going to give me the answer. She's telling me she doesn't know what the answer is. And if she doesn't know what the answer is, what's my role in this? My role in this is to help contribute to figure out the answer. They did very interesting research with one of my clients where um, they took a bunch of leaders, strong leaders, mediocre leaders, and they said, what distinguishes the great leaders from the mediocre leaders? What distinguishes them? And they first they went to the leaders themselves. And they said, what is it that makes the difference? And they said things like really clear sense of vision, uh, 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 an ability to bring people behind, to set a direction, and to bring people, to influence people so that they're following what you know is the place that we're trying to get to. That's great leadership. Then they went to the people who followed the great leaders, the followers, the employees. And they said, what is it that makes great leadership? What distinguishes great leaders from mediocre leaders? And the answer was unanimous. People who ask for help. I want to know that my leader is going to come to me and ask me for help. Innovation, creativity, engagement comes out of that room of not knowing. It doesn't come from knowing. If you as a leader know things, then there's nothing left for me to do. If the television show started by saying, by the way, here's what happened, <laughs> right? how long would you watch? you would get bored and you would leave. All of the richness of life, all of the richness 
of leadership comes in not having the answer and creating space for other people to come up with answers. Innovation starts from that uncomfortable, vulnerable place of not knowing of not knowing what to do next, of not knowing what the answer is. The feelings of not knowing. As I was listening to Jeremy, I was thinking, it would be great if it felt like chariots of fire. <laughs> right? Da da da. I know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. This is great. <laughs> that is not my experience of not knowing. My experience of not knowing is a cliff that I'm about to jump off. My experience of not knowing is weakness and vulnerability. And yet, here is the secret. You have to have tremendous confidence, tremendous self-esteem, tremendous strength to not know something. Not knowing requires the greatest leadership of all, because you're not forgetting something. You're not not doing your homework. When you're not knowing, you're admitting to the truth and the reality of life. And if you can start from that truth and reality of life, that we don't actually know. We don't know. We don't know what the market's going to do tomorrow. We don't know what interest rates are going to do. We don't know exactly the right thing to say with a group of people who are scared. We don't know exactly the, exactly the next move to make when you know, we're in a situation that requires quick action. We don't know how to think thoughtfully through something and make sure that the decision that we've made is the right decision. We don't know. We don't know. And it is from that place from that insecure, scary place that requires the utmost of confidence and strength to sit in, that creativity and innovation is born. So from that place, my wish for you and for me is that we are able to stand in that place without running, to shut the door and sit there for a few moments and recognize and, recognize and have the strength to accept that we don't know. And from that place, innovate, and from that place create. Because innovation comes not from knowing, but from not knowing. Thank you very much.